You're listening to Numerically Speaking, the Anaconda podcast. On this podcast, we'll dive into a variety of topics around data, quantitative computing, and business and entrepreneurship. We'll speak to creators of cutting edge open source tools and look at their impact on research in every domain. We're excited to bring you insights about data, science, and the people that make it all happen. Whether you want to learn about AI or grow your data science career, or just better understand the numbers and the computers that shape our world, Numerically Speaking is the podcast for you. Make sure to subscribe. For more resources, please visit anaconda.com. I'm your host, Peter Wayne. Welcome, James Cham. Hi, thank you so much for coming on today. And, uh, and I'm really excited for our conversation today. So uh, I'm sure many in our audience are already familiar with you, um, but uh, for those who are not, can you share a bit of background on who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm a seed stage investor in a bunch of companies. I work at a firm called Bloomberg Beta, where Bloomberg is our only investor, and I primarily invest in the future of work, which is everything from machine learning infrastructure on up to productivity apps. And I've had the good fortune of having many interesting conversations with Peter late at night, either in person <laughs> or over Twitter. And so I'm glad to get a chance to have one of these recorded for posterity. Yeah, this is going to be I'm so excited and I always enjoy our conversations so much. Um, what, do you want to tell us about a couple of the portfolio companies that you've uh, invested in that you're you know excited about or the kinds of things they do so people get a sense of the variety of investments uh, you all do there? At Bloomberg Big Enough. Yeah, you know, I mean, we've been lucky, right? You know, sort of throughout my career, I've been lucky on a bunch of seed investments. So it's everything from seed investments in companies like Twilio and Dropcam all the way up to more recently investments in companies like Weights and Biases and Streamlit, right? And so you get a sense there Very nice. of the, the sort of things that I'm most interested in. And to be honest, you know, I'm animated by that combination of the founder and the idea with just a little twist that makes sense or the, sometimes the inversion on commonly held wisdom or the sort of like slightly askew angle that might make a big difference. Right, right. Yeah, there's got to be an angle, right? It's uh, what I've noticed in, in um, speaking with a lot of investors and, and venture capital folks is that um, the opportunities, a lot of people see the different opportunities, but um, but a lot of the what I, I think of the, the great investors, they're looking for the founders, looking for the people who have an insight, a different angle a little bit um, on this stuff. So um, you guys, congratulations, by the way. Uh, I saw that you guys just closed a, um, a new fund. And so you'll tell me about that and look about the kinds of businesses and founders you're looking for uh, to invest in with that fund. Yeah, you know, so we just announced our fourth fund. And so we've got two parts of that. One is sort of our core business, which is investing, you know, about a million bucks in seed stage or pre seed stage companies. Uh, the labels change, but the nature of the relationship and the entry point remains the same, you know, whether, right. whatever you call it. Um, and then maybe we'll have a metaphor other than agriculture. You know, you know, sort of like, <laughs> Um, and then we've also got a sort of a follow on fund that's for opportunistically investing in companies we're already invested in. So that's like the, the core of it. And then the kinds of things I'm looking for are a wide range of sort of attempts to take what I'd sort of say are like, or at least the way that I'd put it is that we're still in the middle of figuring out what software is good for, right? And whether that software is <laughs> data driven stuff or machine learning, right? And that sort of like that connection, we're still like looking for those little unlocks. And mm -hmm. in my world, right, so much of that really is around unlocking developers, unlocking analysts, unlocking knowledge workers. And so that's the rough way that I think about it. And that's the rough place that I hunt. Okay. So, um, that, so we're going to get back and, to that. That's can, a very so provocative. Can, <laughs> and you can fold in all the buzzwords, right? So whether right, you want right. to fold in low code, no code, whether you want to fold in WebAssembly, all those words you can fold in, but that's the right. core part of it, right? Can we actually radically unlock productivity? And productivity is a bad word. Productivity, not in the economic sense of the word, but productivity in like the broader sense of like actually getting people to do things, right? And so um Right, That's the mission. Right. That's the dream. Okay, yeah. So, so there's a lot there. We could just on the last few sentences, we could do a lot because it's a very provocative statement to say we're trying to figure out what software is good for. Um, and there are companies, software companies with market caps in the tens of billions of dollars. Um, so um, so we're looking at this and we're like, okay, 
certain investors, of course, famously have said, have said the software is eating the world. Um, and you, so by asking the question, you know, are, we're trying to figure out what's, what is software good for. Um, compare and contrast the point of view there, right? If you're coming from this point of view, of, because it sounds like you have a much more critical or maybe you have more of a, um, uh, you, you, you have higher expectations for what software really could do for people. Versus merely, oh yeah, it's making it's better than pen and paper, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too metaphysical about it, right? But it <laughs> takes time, right? It takes it doesn't take one generation; it takes multiple generations to really fold in some new fundamental technology. And you do mm -hmm. have to remember that software software is basically magic, right? The fact that we yes. take these very big numbers, we take these very big numbers, we agree on how to deal with these big numbers and break them up into instructions is like a crazy idea, right? And the fact mm -hmm. that we have consistent ways of moving these numbers around and then like convincing people to do things based on it is like, I don't know. So I'm conventionally religious, like I'm a Protestant Christian, right? Like I'm mm -hmm. a super normal, but Go back a thousand years, the sort of things we do, if I, if you really explained what software did to someone a thousand years ago, they really would think it's magic because it is. It's amazing that we've managed to coordinate and all agree on these things. And we've managed not just at a human level, but even all the way down to like electrons. The fact that we've all agreed on this is sort of one of these sort of like maybe one of the most impressive acts of collective intelligence, like known in history, you know, and, and yeah. what to me is exciting about it is like, there's a sense that, oh, we know the answers already. And I think that's a very bad view, right? That, right, that we're, right. you know, the sense that like, oh, you know, and, and that's, by the way, that is bad for the for the technical utopians who sort of feel like who are not humble about sort of understanding what the future could look like, but also it's bad for the critics who don't realize that like these things all can change, right? That the fact right. that we're still all, you know, it's possible that 500 years from now we're still stuck on Unix and the internet, right? It's also possible that we won't be, right? We're still so early right. and then that willingness to be humble about like how that change could happen and that openness to the next great angle or the great next great founder, that's the exciting thing about this stage. Yeah, I think what you're, to use a different metaphor, you're sort of Morpheus looking for, for the Neos that can see through the matrix, right? Because if you are merely a conventional user of these things, you're born into a world, someone drops a smartphone in your hand, you know, you're still stuck, stuck in your thumb, you're looking at a smartphone, you're know, sure. like, everything that's here is here. Just like you would grow up in a city and you're surrounded by walls and there's pavement, Underneath the pavement, there's subways, but someone dug the tunnels. Someone ran all the steam pipes. Someone built these giant concrete forms on which the the, the elevated roadways are built, right? But right. Um, so everything you're born into, you feel is normal. And we're now, like I'm, I'm in my early 40s. Um, there's a generation of us who grew up in an analog world and watched the digital world emerge. And we could remember when, no, you really had to flip through a book to find someone's phone number, you had to dial the phone number, sometimes on a rotary phone, and it was all just wires, electricity, and pulses, right? And then, um, and so for those of us who are a little bit, you know, later, I mean, mid 40s, I guess, is not young, but it's not old either. But in internet years, it's really old because I remember all the old stuff, right? So for us, we can look at it and say, yeah, of course, it's all just construct. And any of this could change. And, you know, it could be Unix, it could be Windows, it could be whatever. You know, all these things are just conventions. Is it a file system? Is it a directory? Is it a database? Who cares? These are all just conventions. But if you're like a software developer three, four years into the job, you're trying to learn 50,000 different acronyms and concepts. For you, they're all predefined. They're, they're parts of the labyrinth that have already been laid out when you showed up. And you don't realize that it's all, it's actually just, you know, it's it, it it's all construct. It's all right. just essentially coherent inner subjectivity. It's coherent agreed upon protocols, and you can make different ones if you want to. And I think yeah. somehow we've lost that. To your point, right about it's bad for the techno utopians who start with these like these um, imaginary things and believe they're foundational when any of them could change in a on a dime. And it's also bad for the critics because they feel like they're in a sense. They're reacting to things as if they're solid when they're not solid. They're all just conventions. Um, yeah, I think in that way, you know, the, cre the cr like many of the critics who I respect a lot and who I feel like I respect for both thinking deeply about the questions and for sort of examining in a critical light sort of a lot of the 
technical progress we've made. I respect that, but I do worry a lot that they assume that the world is static, right? And yes. that, yeah. And so that part, that part I worry about. And but by the same token, let me just highlight one other thing that you said, which is, you know, sort of. I think the fun thing about my job is I need to be humble enough to sort of be open to something different. But I am looking for people with crazy conviction. Right. Crazy yeah. conviction. Yeah. Ironically, right. right. You know, like, and then, right. and then like on my side, I'm providing enough like faith in them to sort of like, con- you know, either work with them or provide like concrete capital. Right. And then, and, and that's, but I, but then, so the irony is like, I need to be humble about my openness to this thing. But to some extent, I'm also looking for founders who are not that humble, right? That like, like who are crazy <laughs> enough and believe enough to say that, no, 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 I'm going to, I, I, I either see this future so clearly that I, that it's going to happen and it's going to be inevitable. I want to be part of it. Or, or I see this future that I want so badly that I'm going to devote like either the rest of my life or the next few years on sort of making this happen. And that, that sort of, um, that disconnect is often interesting. Well, I think humility, maybe humility and uh, I'll push back on just a little bit of the framing you have there. I think humility and vision or conviction are not antonyms um, mm. in that in, in the, the best sense of humility, in, in, in my view, is openness. Right now, we think sometimes of humility in terms of openness to the idea you might be wrong, uh, but in general, it's a kind of openness, openness that the world might have something new to offer to you. The openness that someone else in this room might have something to offer, even though you think you're an expert on the topic. Right. So even within the confines of what we traditionally think of, you know, um, someone who's who's very arrogant versus humble. Uh, but outside of that, the generalized concept of humility is an openness to things being different than your epistemic boundary. And so to some extent, you can build conviction on that as well, that you're open to the world being different than it is. And not only that, but in addition to that, you have conviction that it could be different in this particular way. That would be much, much better, much more mm. interesting. Right. And so I don't think they're necessarily antonyms um, uh, in, in the way that you, you, I think, kind of position them as, as potentially antonyms. But uh, but I love that uh, that concept. So to then build on the Morpheus Neo metaphor, you're and, and to say let's find something different, a different fo- metaphor than 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 um, farming. You are uh, Morpheus grooming many different Neos to bash themselves into various things to see if they really are the Matrix or if it actually is a solid wall. Um, something like that. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe the word grooming is too too harsh. But yeah, I but you say, I say that is um, <laughs> like that is you know, I think one of the great things about the world we live in right now is that VCs get to do a lot of marketing, right? And mm-hmm. so you hear more about VCs and so then as a founder you get to get a sense of what they're like and you know sort of maybe then have a slightly better chance of choosing to work with someone you like. So that's good. The bad part is if you take any of it seriously because at the core of the entrepreneurial experience is the founder creates the value, right? The team mm-hmm. creates the value. And like, you know, if you end up treating your, your VC as like a Yoda, then you've kind of failed, right? That mm. your VC is just like one person in your ecosystem that helps, right? And the precise assistance and perspective and, you know, maybe injects either some energy or some capital or some time, you know, sort of along the way, but the core of it is going to be you. And you know this, right? That like, like yeah. even the best, most famous VCs in the world, they're still there, like, like sort of, sort of providing the perspective, but not actually doing that core work and that core hard work of creating the future. Right, right. Yeah, they're providing the, the capital at the end of the day. They're very honest. Yeah. It's venture capital. It's high risk right. capital management. So, um, but uh, but there's something else you said too, which is um, when you're looking at um, you know people who can imagine different kinds of software architectures. Now, obviously, from the perspective as an investor, it's not just pure software architecture nerding out. You want to see new kinds of businesses emerge, ideally higher productivity um, tools lead to different kinds of business models, right? And so is there a sense where, um, you know, what, one thing I do get, I mean, you're, you're very right in saying that VCs have a lot of um, space and, and time maybe to, to market themselves. Um, and they will, I, what I've seen is there's a, sometimes a narrative of like, oh, here's a market opportunity emerging, or we invest in this kind of business model or whatever. But as a software guy and as a software architect and, and someone who likes to visioneer things that don't exist, um, for me, it always seems like 
software architectures and business models co-create each other, that neither sort of exists in a vacuum. Do you have any thoughts on that? How, how does that hit you? I mean, I think, yeah, there's always a co-creation sort of um, dynamic, but I kind of disagree. If you're going to say, what's the chicken and the egg, right? Like what's first? Like right. what's the, con- like, and I, I'd say something a little bit different. I'd say that actually okay. sort of not just technical architectures, but the development process for specific technical architectures mm. like that, not, the, not just the development process, narrowly speaking around how you check in code, like write some code and check it in, but how you understand requirements you know, how you change your understanding of requirements, how you write the code, check it in, deploy it. Like that cycle, right, is different depending on technical architectures. And then that cycle then has different characteristics, economic uh, characteristics. Yes. Right? And when you have different economic characteristics and different business models lend themselves to those development art, like right. characteristics. And so, right. so that's why okay, yes. you look, right? And you look at long arc of history. Okay. Long arc of history, 60 years, right? There's a lot that <laughs> long, right? And then you'd say, you know, the process for IBM building Sabre, right, is very different than the process of the 24-year-old building the latest machine learning architecture, right? And because right. that process is different, the way to deliver value is different. And thus, there are different business models that become enabled, Right. And so like like the the crazy huh. thing, the yeah. crazy thing to to like anyone, if you talk to someone who's a developer in the I don't know, I guess the 80s, the idea that you have constantly upgrading software, right, constantly upgrade is, is, is like crazy because the first idea would be that the software is always available. Right. And so like that sort of shift is, you know, I'm an investor in this company called Launch Darkly. Right. Like that mm-hmm. sort of shift Right. That's that only makes sense if you have like always available software and right. the chance to update at any point. Right. And then that only makes sense in the case where you have this entire infrastructure for developing software online. And then that part only makes sense if you've done all this work. And, and so like that's what those are the like slightly crazy shifts, which, you know, like you talk to someone who might have retired from software development like 30 years ago. They're like, this is crazy. And, right. and my right. guess is. And so this is the part where this is the speculative part, which is my guess is we now live in a world where people take data seriously in a way that they really never have before. And that's sort of like in the same way that we moved to this always available software had all these implications, like this world in which we take data seriously. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm going to be snarky about it, but I'll describe what I mean in a second. But that in mm-hmm. that world, that there are new business models that make sense for that world. And mm-hmm. okay, and so what do I mean when I say we take data seriously? What I mean by that is, you know, sort of if it, I, I built at some point like you know some warehouse management system, right? You know, it was great. You know, like I was super proud of myself. But the truth is that we really use that data f- for two reasons. One reason we use the data was to make sure that the government understood how much money we were like they were making, so they can then write off whatever for taxes and you know sort mm-hmm, of like mm-hmm. like we really did for regulatory reasons, right? To like show the government that we're paying the right amount of taxes. I mean, ultimately, like you know, go down the number of steps that or to create like data points that would support the argument of some middle manager who wanted to do something, right? right. Like that meaning that like it was really either the data was. We were said we use the data for data-driven decision making, but that wasn't really true, right? And the profound shift that happened, you know, over the last decade or so is that there are a whole set of companies that only could work at scale if you took data incredibly seriously, right? Right. And and um, because otherwise you couldn't, you know, I don't know, whatever. You can do the matchmaking to find the car, you know, to make the offer to some have someone drive or whatever, like all those sorts of matchmaking things, all the sorts of like um, uh, all the commerce, uh, uh, like all those pricing decisions, all those sorts of things, actually, they were sort of like a fundamental shift. And in that case, that's why you have, you know, as you know, the rise of a whole set of companies that worry about data quality or think about data definitions in a very different way, right? In a way in which it feels right. much more life and death and thus, Life and death for the company, not life and, and sometimes life and death, right? You know, for healthcare, um, and so in that world, you know, sort of like we're we're just figuring out that 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 that's how we change our point of view, and then what mm-hmm. we haven't done yet is figured out all the business models that lend themselves to that change. 
Right. Yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack there, but I fundamentally agree with you that for all the talk about big data, for how much of the world runs on data systems, for the most part, data is still a static almost post. It's a thing that's produced by processes as opposed to being the substrate in which informationing happens, right? And one of my absolute favorite pieces ever that I've ever read about about information and 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 this kind of stuff is um, uh, it's the um, the uh, selling wine without bottles and it was written it's on the EFF website it's um, let's see if we can find we'll we'll add it to the um, uh, we'll add it to the show notes here I recommend everyone read it but um, yeah selling wine without bottles by John Perry Barlow and it's about the economy of mind on the global net and that's where he. Um, articulate some of uh, Greg Bateson's ideas about information is a verb. It's the dance, not the dancer, right? Um, it's uh, and so the the thing about what you're talking about with you know we haven't yet figured out what um, what software is really supposed to do and what it's good for, but um, we are trying to. Um, but now as we think about moving to a world where in a data rich world, data is the is the substrate on which we build new business models. Um, that's it, and that's different data. It's not transactional data. I'm sorry. It's not data for the purposes of just transacting into a database. Is that kind of motion software doing that and the data systems that support that? That's still sort of a what is it? It's um, it's like a record keeping system. It's sort of long range telepathy, right? Deeper telepathy between people and systems and whatnot. But what you're talking about is really decisioning, informationing predicting all these kinds of things that are only possible once you have a data rich environment, once you're able to observe all these things to surveil all these things about the world or sometimes creepily about people. Once you have those things online, then an entirely different set of business models appear. So right. that's my and, take and on that. Other, and then the other shift though, is that there's a way in which like, you know, sort of you and I, because we've seen the before times, like are just kind of amazed <laughs> that this even works, right? We're just sort of shocked. Right. I mean, the part of me is all just like really impressed that all these things get strung together. And it's going to be the set of folks who see that and take it for granted and say, oh, I don't care that, like, I don't care that you managed to string this together or that your database was consistent. Who cares? I'm, I'm unhappy about the fact that I can't do this, this, and this, and this, right? And that's sort of what you're looking for as well, right? You're looking for yes. the set of folks who then could say, oh, this fits differently and we need to twist it in this way because you know, sort of I'm dissatisfied or I'm, I, I think it's ridiculous that you have these such low expectations, right? So I think that that's... Yeah, you're looking for the people who can see that both, they, that, that, that the walls are made of just light and you're also looking for creatures who can just become creatures of light. That <laughs> beings of pure energy that bounce around uh, making TikToks of themselves as these ethereal creatures and getting millions of influencers. So the other thing though... Uh, tied to what you we said earlier around um, there's something yeah you you talked about it's not just the um, software architectures it's the process of doing product development there's a process of uh, how do I engage with my users with the customers or potential customers find out their needs and then build a thing and that interaction is in a sense it's a what a a, a generalized uh, Conway's law because Conway's law was about the internal right development structures. Uh, how you lay out different development teams and their communication patterns defines a software architecture. It's like defines the internals of a thing. But what you're talking about is sort of a generalization of this, which is how businesses, how product development teams engage with their users, um, that process and the cadence there and the possibility and exposure surface there, that defines to some extent the different kinds of business models that are available. Um, oh, which says me, I, I guess it's not, it's not that it's a, Generalization. It's probably like another level up of abstraction. Uh, of, okay, sure, of sure. Operation, right, which is, and and in that case, it's that you know, sort of ultimately, industry structure is going to be driven by these changes in technical architecture, and these changes in technical architecture, you know, sort of follow some grain of the way that development works today, right? And so that's probably mm -hmm. the the way that I think about got it. Got it. Got and, it. Got it. Yep. Right. And so, go ahead. <laughs> No, no. And I was going to say like, and then the, the other thing about it that's kind of funny is that these ideas, the, in some ways, the ideas or my big disappointment is that the ideas should be obvious and then the implementation should be hard. But there's still mm. not enough variation 
in the ideas. And I think that's partly because we're maybe as a culture a little too worried about harm now and thus we're not willing to imagine a little bit differently. So that's one part. And then I think mm-hmm. the other part is there aren't enough like like, you know, that propagation of folks who understand data or understand machine learning, right? They haven't like propagated up to more leadership roles, right? You're starting you're seeing that, but you're not seeing enough of that. And then the other part is like there's this like there's like this this assumption that the technology is like um I don't know. I'm trying to think of like a good example. Yeah, if you were to talk to some, if you were reading science fiction stories in the 50s and they talk about mm-hmm. mainframes and like, oh, the mainframe will save everything or the mainframe will like control the world or the mainframe will do this, that. And you read it now, like mm-hmm. it's obviously ridiculous. And we're going to think the same thing about an awful lot of writing about machine learning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was listening to a, uh, a podcast um uh, last week, and there was this great. This guy's making a great point that you know we think of information. We still have a very computational paradigm for decisioning, informationing, etc. Um, and he was making the argument. He's trying to make the case that um, thinking is actually an outgrowth of feeling, and that when you have conflicting feelings, then you actually have to think to resolve the conflict between the feelings. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you can run an autopilot just on feelings. And here we are building thinking machines before we built feeling machines. And maybe is that actually always doomed to fail as an architecture or rather it can only, only ever be a shallow imprint of whatever um, paradigm the human architect put into the system, right? That for it to actually develop organic, something aspirational beyond the boundaries of the sandbox we build it on for it to build beyond it, it actually needs to, the system internally has to have conflict that forces then free energy to build the next level of structure, which beyond emotion is thought, right? Something like that. So in what I mean, you're talking okay, about. Okay, so, mm-hmm. of course, like we are now having, uh, I'll warrant, if anyone's still listening or watching, right? I will just tell you <laughs> exactly what Peter and I would do like at around like 1230 at night, right? You know, so like, on, on, on Twitter or something like that. Um, uh, I think it's actually, I don't know whether the right distinction is between emotion and thinking. It might be system one and system two, right? Yep. It might yep. be like sort of like sort of that snap decision versus the reasoned decision. Um, and certainly you feel, you see some of that in companies, right? Where you think about it in terms of escalation, right? You have processes yeah, yeah, and a bunch sure. of business rules are coded and sometimes you need to bubble it up because it, there's enough problems. And then, okay, so now this is the delicious part. I think the delicious part to me is that like right now we concede too much to, by calling something an algorithm, we concede too much, mm. right? And rather the right attitude should be exactly what you said, which is, you know, sort of there'll be times when, the snap judgment or the business rule or the machine learning model will be wrong, right? And understanding like all the trick is not around getting the machine learning model to be right more often. The entire trick is around finding problems in which when the machine learning model is right, you benefit a lot. And when it's wrong, you don't get hurt that much, right? So that's a business model right. problem. It's that's a thing, yeah. right? Or creating a system in which like you understand that it'll be wrong sometimes and you understand how to deal with it. In that case, that's like a bureaucracy, that's a bureaucratic question, right? Not a, mm. not a philosophical question, not right. a technical question, not, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, like it's, it's, and so we're kind of dealing with some of these questions at the wrong level. And at this point, I will have to pitch my two favorite AI pieces, right? Okay. And, and so, um, there's a guy named Henry Farrell, who's mostly like a foreign affairs guy, who at some point wrote this piece, uh, seeing like a finite state algorithm, um, mm-hmm. no, seeing like an algorithm in which he basically does a very good job of thinking about the fact that, you know, these models are like sort of based on data. The data is often generated by people. People have incentives and they will lie and cheat and f- try to fool the model, right? like if it's in their self-interest, right? And so that idea of like, and it's not just around like scary things like like hate speech or stuff like that, but it's also about simple things like making sure that your electric electronic medical record gets approved so you get like billing approved mm-hmm. for like your for your doctor's appointment, right? And it's like, so that dynamic nature, right? I think is like, that's one interesting one. In fact, that it's like baked in, like you're just gonna have to assume that people are gonna mm-hmm. be clever and we're gonna come up ways to cheat the system, right? You know, so that's right. one. And then the other one is, um, 
is, uh, oh goodness, Street Level Algorithms, which is written by these two Stanford guys. And in that case, it makes the point that the right way to think about machine learning systems, the right way to think about it is probably more to think about bureaucracies. And there's lots to be learned from how bureaucracies are managed, right? Mm -hmm. And rather than thinking in terms of, oh, maybe we'll be finally be able to construct our God King machine learning model to do AGI, the right way to think about it is maybe we'll finally be able to do another example of a interesting organizational shortcut and trick, right? In order to, to like make things a little more efficient. And that's what, that's a right. And then, but the model will be wrong. The rules are wrong sometimes. And do we have systems to like blanket that and to deal with it? And so to me, that's like the, um, that's the way to think about it. So, so as a synthesis of this stuff, it's uh, what I'm hearing, uh, and tell me if I'm correct on this, what I'm hearing is that we should be using machine learning and data systems, everything, we should be humble about it and apply it to system one things to free us up to actually address system two for now at a human level. And then maybe if we develop competence there running system one things at scale and with high quality, high fidelity, um, then we can maybe allow them to kind of come into system two. But to try to take system one, system two together, put the whole thing and just say, well, here's a pile of data, here's a pile of GPUs, make the whole decision. And let's evaluate yeah. the whole thing. That's doomed to fail. Is that a, a, a yeah. reasonable well, synthesis I mean, of what it, you're saying? You know, the, the, another way, another angle might be something around like um, uh, there's this assumption that if only if only we get the models right, perfect, then we'll be fine. And like the assumption like nothing's you got to assume nothing's perfect, right? right? And then right. the funny thing is the step before that is oh, if only we get our data perfect. I'm like the whole point of machine learning is like the data is not perfect, right? You know, you know, like, you know, like <laughs> and and so it's interesting to me that and then what's the meta theme there? There's something about diminishing returns, right? Mm -hmm. Around trying to like go for the 99 point whatever, like how many nines do you want, or do you want a system in which you assume that you're not going to get eight nines or seven nines, right? Does that well, make I think sense? it does. It does. And as I hear you talk about this, I can hear, you know, I can hear. Um, C-suite folks who are decision makers, budget holders, and budget approvers who have this mentality, right? That they think of this, they think of, it's almost like they, they look at uh, computer augmented thinking, automated thinking, or computer augmented thinking and decisioning. They want to think of it as an industrial process. And what is the, to your point about calling back to, you know, uh, you know, to the fifties or even the steampunk era, when people are thinking about industrial processes, you build big machines, you put a ton of steam power into it, you build these giant things that all moves and it moves fast and it's hugely powerful. But there's sort of a, 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 almost a simple, naive homogeneity, cleanliness to that thing. And, and in the world of ML and AI, it's almost like these are techniques that are design or data science approaches. These are tools to be used in spaces of uncertainty. These are used when you go outside the bubble. These are these are tools to go into the outdoors, not to be used inside the nice clean city walls where the data is clean, the water's clean, everything's sanitary. And so this idea that um, I guess what I'm trying to go with this is, you know, when you have the buyers as, as a flip or a dual of this idea of Conway's law and building different business models, how business want to procure, how business want to think about what is actually knowledge work? That informs also what possibilities you could of things you could sell to them. And everyone thinks about tools. They they want tools to make better data, tools to uh, label their data, tools to tell them when their machine learning model has gone awry. Everyone is focused on the tools and sort of this industrial way of approaching this almost as an industrial process. When the question I think should be carving out a priori, what are the human elements? Where are the spaces for humans to wield the tools? And from okay. that position... I probably, yeah. on that side, I might disagree. Okay, that, that's all right, let's do it. Like, like I, I actually think that, like, um, the thing about industrial processes is that they assumed that things were not perfect, right? And then the thing is that executives had fine, great, like, the best executives and the most successful ones had, like, a clear understanding of their own industrial processes. They spent a bunch of time... Mm. And understanding it and decomposing it and getting it to work. And so they had like mastery as much as you could have mastery over it, as opposed to conceding it to like, um, to like someone like in like some small part of the organization or to another company or even worse to consultants, 
right? And in some ways, I feel like I'm actually suggesting the the opposite, right? I'm suggesting that, no, you as an executive, you need to really understand it and you can't treat it like the legal team or something like that, right? And I think mm-hmm. that that, the, in some ways, the best executives are going to be the ones who really internalize it and understand what's possible and not possible and have like the right amount, the right mix of skepticism and and sort of like willingness to understand when it does something really, really well, understanding the grain of the product, right? And I think like that, that's one part. Ah, and then okay. the other Right. I like and that phrase. The other part, as yep. you talk about it, right? I realize, you know, sort of one of the things that you and I sort of joke about is like at one point I used to write that, like, you know, sort of I'm like looking for sort of, uh, you know, sort of tools for a more elegant age, right? You know, which is like the lightsaber, right? And right. and I wonder whether I'm wrong about that. I wonder whether the <laughs> the, the look for a tool, right, is is super individualistic. Right. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. I could be the Jedi with the lightsaber to save the organization. And I wonder whether the real search should be for organizational scale services and products that like that could pull things off. Right. And so some so it's like, you huh. know, like like there's a little bit of a like, what's the real problem in Star Wars is the real problem that. The real problem could have been the Jedi's and the fact that they wanted to have like these lightsabers and like be able to save the world individually rather than dealing with things at a systemic well, level. Well, right? it's so it's, a, a it's Maslow's more. hammer problem, right? If you have a lightsaber, you want everything in the world to look like a bespoke problem that needs a right. Jedi to drop in with a lightsaber. Yeah. Right. And right. so maybe the answer is we need bespoke organizations. You know, I've poked around this idea and I maybe you can help me articulate this better. I poked around this idea that I want to invest in organizing like organizational scale user experiences, right? Mm-hmm. In companies that under think of themselves not as like tools for thinking, right? But in in services that think about themselves as like like they think about the user experience not just from a one person to person point of view, but somehow like have a bigger view of things. And I don't mm-hmm. know exactly what that means. You know, sort of we I get taste of that. I've invested in a couple of companies, or we've invested in a number of companies that are all around employee empowerment and stuff like that, right? But the real goal there is to like somehow get an intuition around how do you actually from with software, right, you know, end up creating these sort of think about changing things at an organizational level. And that part I feel like like I'm still I'm still grappling around for that, right? You know? Well, it's it's exactly the right question. And the word I would use is collective sense making. Um, that for the most part, uh, this is now, I mean, you're absolutely right. This is the kind of conversation we would have late at night as it, you know, goes right. off. Into I, the, I, into I, the I kind of feel like I feel a little guilty. I kind of feel like what I should be saying is like, um, you know, whatever data stack and, you know, um, I should be low code, no code or machine right, learning. That's the modern data I stack. Be, I, NLU or, no, I, I feel like I should be stuffing this conversation in with the various buzzwords. So when the transcript <laughs> is produced, it'll show up better in SEO for venture capital purposes or for finding founders or for you sort of entertaining sort of your <laughs> audience. But the, but the, but I, I do think these are like the, deeper, interesting questions. Well, what we want to do is in this podcast, every single, hopefully every single conversation, it goes just one tick more philosophical than people are maybe comfortable or interested in. It goes one tick more technical. It goes one tick more into business versus the not like it just, it's, we're going to do all of it. And that's just, we're going to do this thing. We're going to see if there are people who inhabit the longer tail, you know, kind of uh, a couple a couple of standard deviations out from the mean, but to that point, one. But I think, but you, we really get to the heart of a very interesting thing, which is, you. What you're saying, what I'm hearing is, you want businesses to think about um, decisioning systems, real information systems, as different than mere record keeping systems, like a saber or something, right? Or than or mere. Uh, and if there's anyone from saber listening, I don't mean to to denigrate what you're doing, but it's just more of like, there are a lot of transactional systems that are the um, successes of so-called information technology over the last 50 or 60 years. But a lot of it is database crud. It's a lot of it aggregation, summing things, basically summing things and counting things and doing very simple linear regression. But what we're coming into is this problem of, okay, if you don't think about, you know, you think about the, 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 
big businesses all over the world, a lot of them treat technology as a cost center. Information technology is, of course, you got to have. You got to have email. You got to have people doing spreadsheets to figure out how much money you made or how much money you lost. But at the end of the day, they're just, they're not even system one thinking a lot of times. They are really just almost like sensor systems. They're just telling you which pixels are green or red in your uh, financial landscape. But decisioning still all happens at a very human level. It happens over a lot of emails and calendar invites to talk and people talk and sometimes you'll write things down. But all the actual collective sense making, we use these information systems as basic just sensor systems. Can we now, when we flip to decisioning systems, automated decisioning systems, as they have a layer one, and then the, the deeper question you ask, which is these executives actually becoming aware of the fact that they're not only are they aware that the grain is important, the grain of the wood that's going through their mills, but actually to understand your job is to actually be aware of that because that's the quality of what goes into your entire, you know, every business is an information business. Um, and okay, so let me give you, yeah, so let me give you, what you my play off, riff off that. Well, yeah. I, I, so here's a, here's like uh, sort of one of the concrete examples, like uh, of the sort of inversions that I'm interested in, that I just haven't seen. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, we've got like you've dealt with various annotation systems, right? Either to yeah. say that something's a bridge and an image, or to highlight some text to say that it's like a dog or it's an entity or mm -hmm. it's whatever financial transaction. So, what's interesting to me is that like that sort of structuring of work, right, is only done right now for people who get paid less than ten dollars an hour, right? Mm. The, the vast, vast majority of all that work is of all the tools for that work and all that work really is being done sort of and viewed as sort of simple snap judgment, these sort of things. I think right. that there's a great deal of value in structuring the work that and making legible the work that like sort of knowledge workers, like and these sort of slightly loosey goosey sort of unstructured people like you and me, in the sense that we're executives, we have like lots, we think we have lots of tasks, we think we're really special, like, but I bet you there are a whole set of things that we do that really could be boiled down and digitized and structured in the same way that you'd structure something for Mechanical Turk. And, and sort of like that thing, so that, that seems obvious to me. Now, the part that's not obvious to me is how to do it in a way that like that, like sort of that big ego executive doesn't think of themselves as low value, right? So sort of how do you describe it in a way that does that is status enhancing, right? How do you how do you like quickly create lots and lots of processes like it, that capture the fact that there are all these corner cases? Like that that whole mix, that's the hard part, right? And in some ways I am definitely the way that I characterize it is I am looking for like tools for annotators who don't get paid ten dollars an hour but get paid a thousand dollars an hour, right? You know, mm -hmm. like 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 that's that's sort of like the that's an example then of like like something I think is just right out there. I think that I can smell the opportunity. I can't build it. I can't describe it. And thus I'm sort of sitting around hoping to the universe that someone will do it, but also I'm waiting for the moment that I meet some founder and they say, you know, I've got this like thing. I'm like, oh, this is what you're doing. And they say, oh, you know what? Actually, that is right. That is what I'm doing. And then we get along and then they say, we will take your money, you know, even though your money is so expensive and then we work together and then, you know, sort of five years from now, we're super famous and have some <laughs> so, conference. So with let me, let's, let's, let's turn the tables. We'll see how the, how the tables turn here. I'll play the VC to your pitch on that thing. And I would say this, if you actually had something like the whiff of a technology that could automate away the hundred, not even thousand, but a hundred dollar to $500 an hour kinds of executive level, super white collar sort of tasks. The way you actually make money on this is you don't go to the executives. If you sell them some automated decisioning tool or something like this and you get it wrong, you're fired instantly because the downside is like so hard. No, what you do is you go to the every single you and I know this, all the executives, all the whatever people, at the top of their game and all this stuff. They're surrounded by um, and supported by a next tier of Mandarin. I call them mandarins. Maybe that's not a common term, but there's a tier of ministers. Right. And the ministers are super worried about losing their jobs. So what you do is you produce the prospect of an automated tool that takes their jobs away. 
But what you really do is you sell them the protection to keep their jobs from being taken away. It's a very cynical right. flip on oh, this. Well, okay, so so now uh, I actually have a number of variations. Like I think the way that that core insight gets mm -hmm. implemented in the business model, I think there are lots of the product, the actual product, there are lots of variations. I think, mm -hmm. but just to be clear, I am not saying. I'm actually saying something a little bit different. I'm saying that that okay. way of structuring and describing and thinking about the work is really valuable, right? That like what mm. what the annotator ends up doing to try to flatten something into some vector, ultimately to flatten something to some vector, right? Like that work is actually interesting and valuable. It doesn't necessarily have to lend itself to like a machine learning model that automates everything away, but just that way of thinking about the work that you're doing could be interesting, mm -hmm. right? That like you, you know... Um, I'm in. I'm reviewing some. Uh, I don't know. There, there was a there was a company out of Boston called Resemble that was doing something like this. Resem reassemble that was doing something like this for salespeople, where it'd say you write up your sales report, you highlight the fifteen things like it, in your in your unstructured text that like here are the two objections, here are like the three opportunities, and then we will know that that's where it is in the text, and then we will unfold it in some big table so then you can see for every customer here their objection mm. like that sort of work right isn't necessarily automating something away but it's like taking advantage of all the learnings we've got around tool making for annotators and applying that right. for people who aren't necessarily just getting paid ten dollars an hour right and so or two dollars right, right right and right, so right. i think like that so that's that's i think that's one of the angles but yes there are many other angles on it and i'm super curious yeah. That, um, well, the, I think, do you think Google will get there first with email autocomplete? Basically, at the end of the day, is Gmail autocomplete going to eat this entire category? <laughs> because they literally, I mean, they've got everybody's email. Holy crap, right? That's that's like no one's talking about this or people are not talking loudly enough about this. But it's sort of like that's an amazing corpus. That is an absolutely amazing corpus. Um, it is no, really no, they have impressive. safeguards. But it's still, I mean, Salesforce, you know, similarly, right? All these clouds... Company, the, the, the 2005 to 2010s okay. uh, well, okay, so era SASs, they have a lot of customer data. Well, okay, okay. They do and they don't. So I will remind you of the, electric med the electronic medical record problem, which is mm -hmm. like I, as the hospital or organization or the insurance company, I might want to learn a bunch of stuff at scale about how what treatments work and don't work, right? But the truth is the ground level annotator Right or the 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 sort of data provider, which is say this doctor, the doctor just wants the bill approved, right? So they don't care what they like. I mean, they they're going to be honest, but they're going to say they're going to write the description of it like for a purpose that's at cross purposes from like what the what the organization might think about. And I think like being clear headed about that, that's really valuable. And that's yes, the sort okay. of thing that I think people are just, I think like the smartest people are just starting to get. And I think that that's sort of like the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have now roamed far and wide over all of this. Um, but at the end of the day, we come back down to um, you've got a fund, you're looking to invest in people who have the, um, the, the, what the insight the the to see that the world isn't just the way it's constructed today that it could be something radically different um but that they also want to transform and change how people are able to work together how people are able to net produce more collective intelligence beyond the traditional firm structures that's what i'm hearing like sort of this underlying okay. sentiment I mean, a lot of things you're talking or, about or another way to put it is if you are ridiculous and ambitious and crazy enough to listen to Peter all the way through these sort of <laughs> podcasts, then I'm interested in chatting with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm humbled and flattered, uh, James, that you, you do me a great honor uh, coming on here and having this great conversation. I'm sure we'll have many more. We didn't, we're sort of out of time today, but, uh, um, you know, the thought We didn't that talk about PyScript. Which is like we need to talk about PyScript. Maybe we maybe we talk about PyScript in a follow on, oh, right? Yeah. But the, the the thing I would put in your brain to think about is a lot of the stuff you talk about touches on, in my mind, one of the deepest things in statistics and one of the deep truths we have just sort of in metaphysics is the bias variance trade off that we can either manage variance away so we can better produce, you know, sort of here's a clear offset, here's just where things are at, or we can be tolerant of systems where there's a lot more variance, but we gotta be okay 
with there being a lot more variance. And so if right. we can get anything on the universe, we get a little bit more upside than downside, then we're making progress, right? Right. We also didn't talk about like my two other bugaboos, right? Or my two other things, you know, sort of one is like, um, we didn't talk about like, you know, explore, exploit trade-offs in systems and in people and in decision-making. Yes. And we also didn't yep. talk about like my current silver bullet, which is clearer thinking about error correction. I'm kind of convinced ah. that error correction is not just the key to evolution, but it's the key to like all human progress. But with that, I'll let you go. Thank you. Next time we'll talk about that. That takes us much faster into a metaphysical discussion, um, but a very fun one. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate the conversation. And we'll have in the show notes, we'll have links to some of the things that we brought up and, and the, the articles that you mentioned um, in particular that sound very interesting. Um, so thanks to everyone for listening um, and keep an eye out for the next episode and keep an eye out for the part two of the Peter and James nerding out on the metaphysics <laughs> of, of learning and decisioning. Thank you for listening. And we hope you found this episode valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star review. You can find more information and resources at anaconda.com. 